Item number one is a report from the Bureau of Sanitation uh, on its work with the business community to expand commercial recycling and a summary of related programs that it maintains. Good afternoon, Councilman Alarcon. Um, Karen Coco with the Bureau of Sanitation. Is that on? Is it on? Is that on? It is? It's on low. Can you put it closer to you? Hello? Yeah, that's, that's <laughs> I don't know who's been talking into this. Um, Do it like Madonna does. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Item number one um, is a motion that was first introduced in 2005 uh, during the development of the Renew LA report, which directs the Bureau of Sanitation to look for opportunities to expand commercial recycling in the city of Los Angeles. Um, since that time, the Bureau has implemented quite a number of programs to help incentivize uh, recycling in the city for commercial. Um, just a few of them include the fact that we offer rebates. Uh, our com construction and demolition recycling program was uh, at first just a rebate program but it created enough incentive to drive development of many recycling facilities for construction and demolition debris. Last year, the council voted and approved a mandatory construction and demolition recycling program. So now um, the rebates are being phased out. However, we still have rebates where haulers can actually get their rebate get a rebate on their AB 939 fees that they currently pay by recycling food waste. Um, the rebate is currently $55 a ton recycled and also for mixed MSW processing. And that's currently $10 per ton recycled. So with those programs which are available to all of our permitted haulers, um, will continue to create incentives for the private sector and for the haulers to increase their recycling. But the city also took direct action in several areas. Uh, the construction and demolition program was one of the first examples. Um, we also have expanded our, our multifamily recycling program. It's now over 400,000 units, which um, have blue bin service, which is provided weekly, and for which we contract with uh, private haulers to provide that service. It's very successful. Um, we also have our LAUSD recycling program, where in, um, let's see, 648 LAUSD schools, which is over 70% of all the LAUSD schools in the city of Los Angeles, also have blue bin recycling. Blue bin recycling itself has been expanding with the addition of the cartons and the aseptic packaging. Uh, you probably heard about that recently. So we're actually collecting a lot more material in our uh, blue bins. Do you members concur in the motion? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just, kidding. <laughs> just wanted to wake up the audience. Here. Anyway, uh, please continue. Okay. I don't know why. We just started. I'm just giving a summary of some of the things we've already been doing. Um, so in the food waste arena, uh, we have that rebate that we we offer to all haulers if they recycled food waste. We've got a thousand and fifty restaurants currently participating in, in that program. Each restaurant recycles about three tons of food waste every month. Um, we'd certainly like to see that increase as time goes on. And hopefully, just like the construction and demolition sector, we're hoping that that will incentivize the development of more food waste recycling facilities and different processes to handle that material. Um, one of the things that we proposed in 2006 uh, in our uh, action plan, which was presented to council, was to do business waste assessments, where we do on-site waste assessments for 
the large businesses in the city of Los Angeles. To date, we've done about 850 of those. We've worked with the Gateway Bid on helping them do a consolidated uh, bid process for their waste services. Um, and we've also done a lot of outreach on business recycling. We administer the Recycled Market Development Program, um, the RMDZ, uh, for the state of California to bring incentives to recycling businesses. We also um, are pleased to have back the uh, Green Business Certification Program. Uh, we're working on, we've completed an implementation plan for that with the LA Community College District who is our contractor for that program. And we're gonna be implementing that this fiscal year. We're working on the uh, final three year MOU with them. Uh, so about three months after that uh, MOU is approved, we will be launching the formally launching the Green Business Certification Program. We're already working on, on practicing with the certification software and making sure that we can get the businesses through the process uh, efficiently and easily. Um, so in a nutshell, we've been doing a lot over the past five years. There's many programs that we have implemented, but we need to go further, not only to meet the 70% by 2013. Can I, can I yes. get a clarification? Uh, can you explain the 70%? The, the original request was for 50%. Um, the 70% happened when? I don't, I don't see it in my... Well, the, the city itself adopted a 70% by 2020 goal in 1994. Um, then the state regulations require the 50%, okay. and then a further 70% uh, goal was, uh, the challenge was brought to us by the mayor to get 70% by 2013. So okay. the, that's the goal we're working on. So that's the goal that we're targeting. Yes. Okay. Has the city council had an opportunity to decide on that? Um, I mean, have we? Well, the, in the renew plan, I believe that the council actually adopted a zero waste by 2025 goal. Um, I'm I'm sorry. I don't know if there was an interim goal of the 70 percent by 2013. Does anybody know if the council took action? Just okay. No. Okay. I was just curious. So uh, we never necessarily. Well, the seventy percent goal, but a zero waste. Zero so waste. in in your um, reports relative to this issue in general, um, are you targeting the zero or the seventy? I mean, how, how do you? Well, I would consider the seventy percent an interim goal. Okay. Uh, with the the final goal being uh, the zero waste goal, or really to send essentially nothing to landfill, unless it's been traded first. Okay. Thank you for that. Certainly. So just to um, to wrap up and bring us to present on on item one, uh, we know that that we need to go further to meet the goals. Um, the zero waste goal especially and so we embarked on a, a process to begin the franchising of the multifamily sector in the city of Los Angeles uh, we were given the authority during the budget process the 0910 development uh, so we moved forward with that but in 2010 the uh, there was a motion that was um, it was introduced that directed us to look at the commercial uh, as well as the multifamily sectors and whether it would be advantageous to combine those for um, environmental and efficiency reasons. So we're working on that right now. Um, I know this isn't item one, but uh, that is what we're working on right now. As far as uh, recycling in the commercial sector, uh, I just thought it might be important to note that uh, there were two bills that were signed by the governor, uh, one of them just last week. The first one was AB 818, and that mandates uh, recycling at multifamily complexes of five units or more. And when does that take effect? Uh, July of 2012. The second is AB 341, uh, which has a further mandate for commercial businesses to recycle 
and the recycling program is supposed to be in place by July of 2012. Um, we expect that regulations will be coming out uh, for review in November uh, and will probably be uh, adopted early, um, early next year. But that's the deadline that's in the, the bills that were just signed. Uh, now that includes the, uh, that includes a mandate of 75%? Yes, that's the one where uh, the 75%, the mandate for that, uh, they're directing the department, Cal Recycle, to come back with a plan by 2014 to reach 75% by 2020. Okay. So it's 75% by 2020 is the goal. Okay. How do we get there? Well, I think there's a number of ways that we need to get there. Um, we've had, the city itself has been quite successful in um, our voluntary programs. Uh, the programs where we, we try to create incentives for people, where we try to create an atmosphere to, uh, for folks to expand their businesses, open sorting facilities. Um, but at some point, uh, you have to get past the the level of what is uh, responsive for that and go towards a, a program that requires that people recycle. Well, the state has already done that. So I believe if we implement these uh, recycling programs appropriately, the mandatory programs that are coming to us from the state, I think that we can meet those goals easily here in the city. Okay, now we, uh, it's been quite a while since we um, cap encapsulated a report on on this. What was it? Three years? Four years? A report on the oh these items that are I've been talking about. Yes, and the last um, the last report was uh, the one prepared by Councilman Smith. The renew uh, update uh -huh. uh, that in two thousand seven. Uh, no, the one that was the summary that, that he just uh, presented before council, but the department has not had a report in several years. On okay, things. okay. I think it would be appropriate to have an update okay. from the department. Mr. Chair, can I ask a question? Uh, yeah, but let me, let me uh, make this recommendation, uh, and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. Uh, I, what I'd like to move is a recommendation to instruct the Bureau of Sanitation to prepare an updated report, including any recommendations from commission studies on implementing commercial recycling programs in the city, including timelines and milestones. Mr. Wiesar. Yes. Um, if we adopt that recommendation in item number one, does that conflict in any way with items two or three um, it's different from previous reports on this so does that come item number one in your recommendations uh, the recommendations on there does that conflict at all with two or items two and three today or are we duplicating uh, are we I don't believe that there's a, a conflict uh, I think it is it's all the same subject area and we're all trying and it's all trying to get us to the zero waste goal mm -hmm. so perhaps if the the way you look at it is that these are all all similar items actually and and they all um, go to what is the next phase of um, of the city's um, involvement in recycling and waste diversion so for example develop a RFP for a targeted commercial recycling pilot program um, and on items two or three, we're headed in the same re direction, but it doesn't sp speak about specifics. Item number one is, is speaking more in specifics. So would that? I I'm sorry. The on the CLA report, um, item number one, commercial recycling action plan includes the following items. Oh oh, yeah. I'm sorry. I wasn't sure where you were. I can be uh, quick and add some clarification. Charles Modica from the office of CLA. Um, item one is specifically is kind of a summary of the Bureau's uh, recycling and commercial waste reduction programs and w their efforts to it. Their last report was in 2007. Yeah. Uh, Greg Smith released a report uh, before he left on just the overall status of the program. Uh, but the recommendation from Councilmember Alarcone was to have them prepare an updated report with a report I see. with recommendations. Items two and three are more specific to the actual gotcha. commercial program. That explains it. Okay, thank you. 
Thank you. Uh, sure. Where, where do we stand now uh, currently in terms of uh, percentage of uh, commercial businesses that participate in commercial recycling and the number of multi, the percentage of multifamily buildings that currently participate in recycling? Well, for the multifamily, one is a little easier to answer than the other. Uh, because we provide a multifamily recycling program, the Blue Bin program, for uh, multifamily, I know for a fact that there are 430,000 units um, out of the, the, the number of units in the city that are participating in the city's recycling program. There may be another, a number of other units that are participating in programs, but I know for a fact there are 430,000 of the units in the city are in our current recycling program. So what's the percentage of multifamily that are in versus out? Um, the percentage, uh, it's over 65%. It's probably around 70% of the units in the city are in the program. And how about commercial? Well, with commercial, that's, that's another animal. Um, we have 100 and... In the database that we have, uh, there's about 185,000 businesses uh, in the city. Uh, that number changes on a regular basis. Many businesses uh, move, uh, small businesses primarily. There's, there's hundreds of them coming into being and going out of being on a monthly basis, so that number moves. Um, when we did our Bayshire study back in the year 2000, we did find that the commercial sector was already recycling about 70% of the material they generated. That recycling was primarily um, paper recycling, construction and demolition, uh, things like that. We did not quantify it down to the number of businesses that were, um, you know, participating in recycling programs. But that's all going to change because part of the requirement from the state for the mandatory recycling is for us to monitor. So we actually are going to have to start building a database and gathering that information for um, next year. Okay, thank you. Is there any other testimony from the department? Any questions? Okay, uh, public comment. We have two cards. First, Martha Cox Nidigman. Good afternoon, council members. Just wanted to have some general comments. First of all, I want to applaud, um, maybe I should sit a little closer, applaud um, the Bureau of Sanitation. Um, they've had a number of meetings and reached out to the commercial sector, and we appreciate um, their outreach to our members. Um, first of all, building owners have known for years that hauling costs would continue to go up and that many materials in the office waste stream are easily recyclable and that saves precious resources. I just recently spoke this week to a number of our members, and I learned that the diversion rates for larger office buildings throughout the city are fairly high, 55% to 86% for one of our office buildings downtown. Owners have partnered with their haulers to develop recycling education programs for their tenants, to conduct waste audits, design strategies to deal with um, waste from restaurants and other activities. One downtown owner I spoke with is very excited about their new on-site composting program. Many commercial office building owners work hard to create a sustainable environment for their tenants. They engage in the rigorous process of becoming LEED certified, which includes points for a recycling program. Um, um, and they also, that greening pro process doesn't stop. They also go on to become silver, uh, beyond silver to become gold and platinum certified as well. Um, BOMA, for our part as an association, continues to provide education and information for our members on sustainability, including annual seminars, which provide examples of successful recycling programs. Further, BOMA is currently working with the U.S. Green Buildings Council and with the SEIU to create a green cleaning standard for office buildings, which will certainly include source separation of waste. We are looking forward to partnering with the city and to encourage tenants and building owners to recycle and divert significant levels of waste to the landfills. Thank you. Thank you. Ron Bodoin. Good afternoon. My name is Ron Bowden. I'm general manager at Park La Brea Apartments, and here just to represent a, a private partnership between a private hauler and, and a uh, housing provider in the source separation program. Um, we've had the, the uh, Bureau of Sanitation come out and take a look at our program, and it, it got pretty high marks. 
Um, we do participate in paper separation, bottle glass, um, yard waste, as well as trash and cardboard already. Um, it's a program that can work well um, with a partnership of, of residents and tenants with some education. Um, that's particularly a challenge, I think, for landlords is to, to get the buy-in, I think, even with the city's program, to, to have people do the source separation so that they're getting the right things into the blue bins and the right things into the black bins can be a particular challenge. So hopefully that's something that you'll look at in the future when you're rolling this out to, to help that. Um, another point that, uh, that I'd like to make on this is the, the, the franchise system, because we do use a private hauler. And when you get to deciding about how, that, uh, how that's going to work, I hope that you'll keep it as an, an open franchise system. I understand franchise is how it's going to have to go. Um, but the diversity in this city and the, the varied buildings, businesses, restrictions, and the things that, that um, property owners and business owners can face, I think what's, what makes L.A. great is our diversity and the, and the, the depth of our economy. And, and I worry that a one-size-fits-all trash franchise might be, might be detrimental to to the operations of the city thank you thank you if there's no other comments um, then uh, my recommendation is before us do we have any opposition uh, everybody is in support so that will be the recommendation to repeat the recommendation is to instruct Bureau of Sanitation to prepare an update an updated report including any recommendations from commission studies on implementing commercial recycling programs in the city, including timelines and milestones. Okay, item number two. Item number two is a report from the Board of Public Works on issuing a five-year notice to permitted waste haulers in the city of the city's intention to modify its existing waste hauling system. Good afternoon again. Councilman Alarcon, uh, members of the committee. Karen Coca with the Bureau of Sanitation again. Um, the, this item number two before you is a uh, request to issue a five-year notice to permitted private waste haulers and notify them that uh, the city is uh, looking at moving towards a more restrictive system. Um, the city has both the responsibility and the right to determine the waste services provided in each jurisdiction. Uh, many jurisdictions have elected uh, to make up their system their own way. There's a combination of different types of franchises, um, different types of permitting systems um, uh, across the, the county and, and the state as well as the country. Um, the Public Resources Code, though, in California gives us the right and the responsibility to decide what services best fit in our jurisdiction. The state code also requires um, us to notify businesses uh, in the hauling community if we intend to change from an open system to a more restrictive system. Now, the language in the, the code section that, uh, that requires us to do that, um, let's see, here we go. Uh, the, the language itself in the, in the public resources code section says, um, let's see, if those services have been lawfully provided for more than three previous years by our permitted waste haulers, the solid waste enterprise may continue to provide those services up to five years after mailed notification to the solid waste enterprise by the local agency having jurisdiction that exclusive solid waste handling services are to be provided or authorized unless the solid waste enterprise has an exclusive franchise or contract. Now, the notice that uh, is in draft and it will not be final and sent out until the council um, has blessed it. Uh, it. It contains that language, but there's uh, exclusive and exclusive. And let me give you a little bit of a, a clarification. Uh, the way the the way that it was described to me, and I'm not an attorney, but by the city attorney's office, was that exclusive in this case in the public resources code means that we are going to move to a more restrictive system. Uh, whether is, that is going from an open market to 
a single hauler or multiple haulers that are chosen by some sort of process. Um, if we're going to a more restrictive system than an open market, then this is the language that we have used and has been used by multiple agencies across the state. Whether this, if the city chooses to move towards a, a franchise that has multiple haulers in a service area or a single hauler in the service area, it doesn't call that out specifically. So this is the language that we are using in our notice as um, required in the public resources code. It also does not bind the city to an action. The city is, sends out a notification. It does not necessarily bind them to an action to actually do something. The County of Los Angeles sent out their five-year notice in, I believe, 2003. Um, and eight years later, they're moving into the franchise now, even though it was a five-year notice. Again, it's a notification to the existing haulers that, that this change the city may elect to make this change and gives them that five-year window to capitalize their business or to make preparations to bid on uh, uh, you know, a, an RFP or another uh, type of program to continue to work in that jurisdiction. Could I ask a question regarding that? Um, did we issue our notice? The city issued a notice in 2007 to, or 2006 for the multifamily sector. Okay. We have not issued a notice for the commercial sector as of yet. Okay, did in, in the county's example, did they commercialize in five years or, or, or I'm sorry, um, capitalize in five years? Well, what happened was the, the county of Los Angeles, um, they moved in their garbage um, districts that are across the unincorporated county they have, uh, in a systematic way, gone towards franchises in their garbage districts. So okay, let, let me, uh, what, I'm, what I'm trying to get at is uh -huh. if we did a five-year notice, mm -hmm. I wouldn't want people to be buying a bunch of trucks and, and then have to sit on them for three years. I mean, uh, so I'm asking, in the county's example where they took eight years instead of five, did, was there any capitalization did they did they invest in the in the new system I believe that uh, I, I'm not sure <laughs> I'm not sure of the answer I'm sorry okay so uh, well I think it, it's a critical item uh, for me is to know that uh, we did not tell people we're going to do something they invest in that something and then we we take forever doing it So it's just something to note that we want to be mindful of uh, the the economy and and uh, the difficulty of getting financing in these times to make sure that that uh, that when they do uh, they get a return quickly. Okay. Okay. And so to to conclude. Um, there is a, a draft notice. Uh, it was uh, approved and forwarded by the Board of Public Works to the um, City Council, was referred to the E&E &E Committee, and now um, to this committee. And uh, the Bureau would like this committee to approve the notice and forward it to City Council for consideration. OK, did, uh, did you have a chance to read the letter from Ron Saldana? I did very briefly. And can you describe how and if the report addresses these questions? Well, um, I can only speak uh, technically. I'm not a lawyer. Um, so I'd have to go to the city attorney and ask them specifically. But I think the, the thing that they uh, lean the most on, in my opinion, is uh, the use of the word exclusive in the notice. And as I addressed, that is the exact language that's in the Public Resources Code um, that it could you, uh, to use in could the notice. Could you sort of describe what, what the concern is there? Oh, well, the concern has to do with that the city has not yet decided whether exclusive 
uh, solid waste handling for commercial is to be provided and that we um, let's see and that in the notice as well they they said that the city never determined that the public interest would be better served by an exclusive franchise um, and that no decision has been made on exclusivity again the use of an exclusive franchise but as I pointed out the no anything in the report that suggests that we did no no, the, okay. the report itself just asked to issue this notification. And as I said, the notification does not bind the city to So the bottom line that. is the, the goal is zero waste in whatever year, and, and the recommendations are tied to that goal. Yes, they are. Okay. <coughs> Mr. Kretz, did you have any questions? Yeah, I've got a few. Um, First of all, my, my sense of the five-year notice is also that it's it's a warning that the city might do this. So, in other words, it wouldn't be wise to replace your entire fleet if you only serve a part of Los Angeles and you may not get this franchise. Um, it's a warning. Don't put a lot of money into it right now because we could move in this direction. Um, that's my understanding. I don't know if that's correct, but that seems to be the most key part of why you issue this kind of a warning um, I believe it is a it's a letter of intent but it doesn't necessarily go to the specifics of where you're going to go with your system but it certainly can be construed as a you know a, a warning that we are we're going to change our system in the near future and it doesn't commit to actually making that change no it but does it, not. but it does give people a fair warning and they can make their business uh, judgments based on that. Uh, is that correct? Uh, that is essence? that is the interpretation that we have. So, what's the next step in the process? Uh, once we issue this, are there logical next steps uh, um, and things we can do during the five-year period? What do we do next? Well, I believe that um, issuing the notice is important, so that there is that it starts the clock on that five-year window. Um, I also believe that um, the next step would be then to decide on the type of system that the city wants to transition into um, to reach its goals, uh, both the zero waste, the mandatory recycling, and environmental goals that we have. But uh, by putting out this, just to make it clear, we're not necessarily saying that we've decided to do anything in particular no it's just it's just a warning that we're we're considering some kind of action that's that's our interpretation of the notice um do we have information from all the haulers on uh their accounts how many accounts they have how many addresses how many bins do we the, have any do we have that information and can we ask for it if we don't um, and the answer commercial is commercial accounts. All those right. questions. Uh, we don't ask by account right now. We get uh, their information because we we audit gross receipts to get our our fees, the AB nine thirty nine fees. So we do have some um, relative information about uh, you know how much they pay by fees. So we do that, but we do not currently ask for how many accounts they have. Uh, we will have to ask for uh, expanded information, though, in this uh, coming permit uh, season, which is will be upon us in early spring, um, to meet the mandatory recycling requirement. We're going to have to ask them how many customers they serve that are multifamily, five units and above, and how many commercial businesses that get four cubic week, four cubic yards a week of trash service or more. So. We're going to have to get that information and also how many of them have recycling programs as well. Uh, that's required of us. And that's because of the new state yes. legislation. Yes, the monitoring by the state requires that we know. And we have a seven-year notice that went out in 2006 uh, relating to multifamily residences. Related to multifamily, that's right. What, what's the status of that and how does it impact uh, what, we're, what we're trying to do more broadly with multifamily and commercial well the the notice was issued quite some time ago um, a, as I said early uh, 
you know, the intent was to transition to a, a franchise type of system um, because we do currently subsidize the multifamily recycling and we wanted to move it all into one system where it was a package to have the recycling. Um, the uh, commercial notice uh, does not affect that since it only targets the commercial business properties. So um, I believe that the multifamily notice has already happened. Um, and basically says that in July of 2013, we can adopt a new system and implement that. Okay, one last question. Have, have we reviewed yet the potential costs or potential revenues of switching to uh, a franchise system for waste hauling? CLA or CAO done that? And if not, when are we planning to do that? Oh, well, it has not been done at, at this point. Uh, we're working on um, a staff report right now. Uh, we have a consultant who's looking at the different types of systems, and also we're going to have a staff report ready to go um, in November. Actually, one more question. Um, are we expecting to have exemptions for hospitals or universities? Cedars or UCLA, USC? I think that in the staff report, we're going to look at types of waste that will not be uh, included in a system. For example, medical waste. Uh, that is handled under a different type of system. Um, we also are looking at construction and demolition debris. Uh, but those as classes of material, um, not exempting specific um, businesses okay. thank you I wanted to uh, clarify uh, has the CAO uh, reviewed these recommendations uh, the five-year notice recommendations the yes the public works board report I believe that it was waived it was waived uh, from CAO report okay so uh, for this particular item okay the bottom line is that um, are you saying that we cannot achieve the mandated requirements if we do not see significant changes in what we're doing? Well, I believe that the 75, as great as we are at recycling and waste reduction in the city, I believe that we need to um, raise the bar to be able to meet uh, additional mandates, and especially the 75%. And, and and given that the, for example, the uh, multifamily residences are already at 65%, and that's an estimate, um, where are we now in terms of our recycling? Are we, we're at 50%, but how, how much further? Well, the city, the city right now um, is at 65%, but, which is a, a great number, and we're doing a lot of work now. But we're never going to get over that next hurdle until it becomes more of an overall um, where everyone is expected to do their part in recycling, where everyone has an opportunity for recycling, mm -hmm. whether at home or at work. And the system that we have in place doesn't give that the overall ability to do that. Okay, so as well as we've been doing, We've got to do more. We've got to do a lot more, and the uh, and that's that's just to get to the seventy five percent, and then we have the zero waste goal uh, that uh, that we've created for ourselves. Yes. Okay. Um, so tell us what what are the next steps in this process? Are are we talking so about if we issue the, if we issue the notice? Mm -hmm. um, does that mean we can't do anything until five years? No. It, I, what will we be doing in that five-year period? Basically, what, what we will be doing, the, the um, department is bringing a report to our Board of Public Works next month um, to talk about uh, the next steps. Um, we have to embark on that, uh, that process as soon as possible. Um, as you know, the city processes sometimes take some time. So um, we would be looking then for direction from the mayor and city council, the policymakers, on the direction that we take 
in this next step in our system and get that process started. Our, our, our waste hauling system has been sort of uh, uh, driven by the market in such a way that you have some big players that get, you know, 80% of all of it, and then you have a bunch of little players that get uh, the other 20%. It sort of has has worked out for a lot of different elements. Can we create a system that respects um, those uh, all that respects all the people that are currently involved and gets to the recycling mandates? I believe that there's there's some things that can be done. First of all, if we're looking at exempting classes of material, many of our, our smaller, small, small waste haulers uh, only haul construction and demolition material. They do what we call a roll-off business. Mm -hmm. um, so the majority of the small haulers only provide that type of business, and, and it's quite a competitive field. Um, if we exempt that material from, uh, say, a franchise, then that gives them the ability to continue to survive. The other thing is to make sure that there's enough competition that the medium size, what we call medium size, would be large anywhere else. A medium sized hauler really has the ability, um, if there is an RFP process, has the ability to, to come in and really bid on those and get some, um, some of the business in the city. Now, one of the things um, I don't want to name any names. I don't. I, I haven't. It's not like I've done an exhaustive study, but it's a dirty business. <laughs> the uh, particularly the recycling function and the workers uh, have some very deplorable conditions. Um, I would assume that the department would come back with recommendations on how to upgrade uh, those working conditions uh, to meet the standards that the city of Los Angeles. Uh, has imposed on others, um, and it would have to be meted out fairly. And that that way, I think, if 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 we do that, uh, then everybody would be on the same playing field uh, competitively and would not be driven to uh, the worst working conditions uh, to be able to compete. Um, actually. Uh, thank you for bringing that up because we've had a series of stakeholder meetings and uh, we've taken to heart many of the comments that, that we received. Um, there were, I think, 240 folks that took their time to come in and, and tell us and a reoccurring theme had to do with uh, working conditions, uh, primarily at uh, recycling facilities. So our staff has been doing some investigation on um, who's responsible, you know, for making sure that, that these things don't happen and where are the gaps because the, it's obviously happening. So um, in our staff report, we're going to have some of that, that information so that perhaps we can um, put together a, a way to move forward on that. Now, it, are, uh, if there are any uh, current conditions that uh, um, might be in violation of, of existing um, health requirements and safety issues, um, access to restrooms, um, working in exposed uh, condition, break periods, those kinds of things. Um, are we are we finding any of that? Are we acting on it? Well, the the department itself, um, we don't contract with uh, the the one, the type of facilities that they're talking about. It's called a a, a dirty MRF. Um, that's where you take trash and you're actually sorting trash rather than recyclables. Um, but there are uh, inspections that take place. The problem is I believe that they're not frequent enough. And also that, um, you know, we have our local enforcement agency that goes and inspects these facilities and they will note uh, practices if they see them, if they're happening when they're there. Um, and and let Cal OSHA know about it, but we don't have a process in place locally to yet to make sure that 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 stops happening. Okay, and your report would have recommendations on that. 
Well, I'm not sure if we'll have all the investigation done, but we'll certainly have enough information to start that that discussion so that we can make sure that the the system that is eventually adopted by the council um, includes some of those. Well, regardless of whether it's eventually adopted, they're doing it now. And it just seems to me we ought to take whatever actions we can now to to make sure that these operations are 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 operating in a way that okay. provides for decent w decent work conditions um and I believe that if we don't do that then then right now there's unfair competition in the workplace because if somebody's uh, cutting corners in terms of uh the health and safety in the workplace then then the public is getting an unfair price based on uh, cutting corners in a way that that is harmful to somebody so it seems to me that that as we're going through this analysis we should I, I, is there no way i mean don't we have building permits <laughs> don't we have business permits that allow people to operate and aren't they required to operate in accordance with the law and um yes everybody is required uh where where we have to do more investigation is that that many of the facilities that our material is taken to from inside of the city are not inside of the city. So we're going to have to, um, that's why I said we're going to have to investigate, mm. but we'll certainly include some some recommendations in the report. Okay, thank you, thank Mr. you. Mr. Chair, if I, if yes, I could please. add to that, uh, um, I had a meeting with some employees just to get a sense of, of the kind of conditions. and. You know, there are folks that are handling dirty needles and broken glass and not even supplied gloves. I mean, some of these facilities are, are you know, would, would be considered an embarrassment if people knew the kinds of conditions that, that folks are working in. So I agree with the, with the chair that uh, we shouldn't wait until we go through this whole franchise process. We need to get a handle on this sooner if we can. Mr. Rezar? Yes, just on the question that Mr. Koretz brought up about getting some information on the number of bins, et cetera, from our permitted haulers, we don't have that information. Can we get that information? We can certainly request the information and... Um, Nothing in state or our own regulations that asks for that information already? No, at this point, we require them to give us the information uh, sufficient for us to audit them to get the revenue um, certainly we can we can get that information you know but wouldn't it help us in terms of how what type of policies we're making and to know what the industry looks like out there and what's going on out there well I think that um, uh, certainly I, I don't disagree I mm -hmm. do know that we know relatively uh, the haulers and um, what they're doing out there in the city it is not business by business at this point. Like I said, we're going to be requiring them to give us that information. But we also have to be ready to receive the information so that we can sort it by council district, by other uh, factors. So mm -hmm. we have to not only get the information, but get it in a form that it is usable to us. And not everyone is has a, a sophisticated system for keeping records. Um, you would be surprised at what we see when we go out and, and audit. There's a, a lot of paper still. So what's the best way to go about and get some of, to get some of that information? Uh, we would basically request it of our haulers. Um, is there a specific? <laughs> I mean, would we have to pass a new ordinance or administrative? How does that work? Or we just administratively ask for it voluntarily? How, how would that work? Dan Myers, Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, I would start with, because we could do it immediately, uh, ask for the information voluntarily. And we could ask for that of our haulers now. Yeah. Um, we, we do have, I think, good working relationships. And I think many haulers would supply us information. Uh, it, we also have to uh, know how we ask for the information. Right. Uh, as of right now, waste haulers are very protective of their customer lists and what their customers are paying and where they're located uh, because that that is their livelihood. 
that 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 lists uh, of customers and their level of services um, are exactly what you know other competitors would want to have to try to go after businesses. Mm. So we do have to be very mindful also in how we ask for the information. We've had a, a lot of internal discussions on how we could do that to to protect the haulers uh, for their investments they have and still give us the information. Moving forward, what we could do is look at modifying the permit conditions for their next uh, permit go around. Right now, their permits are good for, from July 1st to June 30th. So, uh, but the information is due to us in April. So we could look at modifying the the permit to include some of the information to get it out of the haulers that say aren't giving it to us voluntarily at this time. Um, but again, I would I would recommend as we move forward to ask for the inform information right away. It may not be everything, you know, customer names, but that's not necessarily what we would need. Level of service and waste collected would be. Yeah, I would urge that we do that. Well, if we could determine what protects their investment and um, protects their business uh, practice. But at the same time, we as policymakers need some general information about what's out there, you know, who's hauling what, uh, you know, how much commercial versus otherwise. And yeah, we've, we've discussed that. The more information we have, the better we could uh, make some informed decisions. So uh, I would urge you to go out there and see what we can get, no matter what direction we need to go. I think that's just some very general, inf basic information we need to get. Okay. Okay. Um, we have quite a few cards, about uh, 20 maybe. We're, everybody gets two minutes. I'm going to be calling people up in threes, if you will. If you if you need to take a chair, I don't believe Mr. Kukorian is going to be able to make it, so you, you can borrow this one. Um, let's see. First, we have Michael Millman. Uh, then we have Tracy Chavira. Uh, then we have Harold Greenberg. Mr. Chair, is this on item two and three or just two? This is just on two. Good afternoon, Michael Millman. I'm from Mar Vista. Thank you for letting me talk. And I certainly enjoy the opportunity of, of having coming here and having two minutes as opposed to one, even though I'm an attorney and I'm used to addressing a juries quickly. Let's be honest. Exclusive franchise means code for what? Monopoly. Sooner rather than later, the big five are going to control the entire L.A. and be able to take the prices as high as they want and strangle out the small apartment owners. So all you've really done is put a big go for big business in Burbank, Glendale, Pasadena, Santa Monica, Culver City, Inglewood, Beverly Hills, and even West Hollywood, because that's where the developers will go because they won't have to pay the high fees for water, trash, and sewage. I was going to read the section on rent control. Everyone knows it, that commercial rent control is illegal, but it is insightful when it says these controls also discourage competition in the open market by giving artificial price benefits to one enterprise to discourage the advantage of another. Civil Code Section 1954.25, it goes on to say, no municipality may enact commercial rent control. Stay away from it. There are small haulers. They may be in Mar Vista, they may be in Venice, but they may be in Pacoima and they may be in San Fernando who you are giving, you're gonna put them out of business. The system works, don't break it, it's fine. Everybody's gonna be up to speed on the environmental issues. Let's not worry about it. Let's not fool with a system where everyone's doing extremely well. Don't tell the developers, the owners, to go to Glendale or some other jurisdiction, even lovely West Hollywood. Thank you for your time. Tracy? Good afternoon, Tracy Shavira, Central City Association. For those of you who don't know, CCA is a business membership organization whose 450 members represent over 350,000 people, employees in the LA region. Um, while we support the city's diversion goals and understand the need to close the budget deficit, we do not support a system that reduces competition, increases costs, and puts people out of business and out of work. Uh, we hear speculation about the number of green jobs that will be created, but we believe, especially during these tough economic economic times where we're experiencing double-digit unemployment rates that 
a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush. Um, CCA represents a majority of large property owners in downtown Los Angeles. By virtue of being an urban environment, there's very little physical space. Most properties are built lot line to lot line. Therefore, we can't support what I've read in the report um, about on-site source separation. There's simply no extra room for recycling bins. Many of these buildings are historic. They have built-in trash chutes. You can't just simply build, uh, build a, a recycling chute. So these are the types of concerns that must be addressed. And I believe someone before said a one-size-fits-all approach isn't going to work, and we couldn't agree more. Um, lastly, the consultant's report that aims to identify franchise models hasn't been released. So we believe that it's premature to move forward. Uh, we oppose the inclusion of commercial property in an exclusive waste and recycling franchise system. And we ask that this body not approve the five-year notification. Thank you. Harold Greenberg. Harold Greenberg, Apartment Association, Greater Los Angeles. We vehemently oppose this particular program. As was stated before, it's a question of competition, it's a question of jobs, it's a question of leverage. We represent over 350,000 units in the city of Los Angeles. We basically represent the mom and pops in the industry. We today have leverage. If we deal with one waste hauler and they do poor service, raise the prices, et cetera, we can say we're going to some other place. What you're doing is essentially saying we're going to go from about 132 haulers down to about seven or eight. You're cutting out competition. You're going to be cutting out jobs. You're going to be cutting out service. You're going to put a situation of raising cost because without competition, the costs are going to go up. What are we going to do? Are we going to pass it on to the tenants, or are we going to have to absorb it? We heard the term subsidy. Nobody is subsidizing our industry of five units or more. We all have private haulers on that particular situation. Basically, the discussion today was hijacking this theory of franchising. We spoke about recycling. That's mom and pop. That's apple pie. That's the flag. Let's talk about what it really is. It's the franchise issue. Are we going to provide jobs? Or are we going to provide competition? Are we going to provide leverage? The other problem you're going to have, I have uh, three apartment buildings and three houses. I have three different trash haulers. If we're going to franchise where they have a, a region or a district, what am I going to do? Who am I going to deal with? This is the issue we have to look at. In addition to that, most of us have long time contracts. What are we going to do? Violate those contracts? Break them? How are we going to handle this? Basically, this is going to be the Lawyers Unemployment Relief Act. And thank you, I'm a lawyer. Thank you. The next three are Martha Cox Nidikman, Lucy Gardland, and Ron Saldana. Martha Cox Nittickman. I'm the Senior Director for Public Policy and Education for the Building Owners and Managers. We represent over 300 commercial office buildings in LA County. Um, BOMA is very concerned um, that the city's five-year notice of waste hauling franchise assumes in its language that the city will create an exclusive franchise. I know the staff came up and they talked about the definition of franchise um, of exclusivity. Um, I'm specifically talking about if one or a small number of haulers was selected. Um, as I indicated earlier, um, office building owners have built relationships with haulers that have proven very successful and innovative in creating an exclusive franchise would rob the owners of their ability to make choices about the services best suited for their properties. We would ask the council to continue to consider non-exclusive franchises this move forward. And second of all, it's clear from examples um, in other parts of LA County that businesses will experience significant fee increases under the exclusive franchise. 60% of tenants in commercial office buildings are small businesses, and these fee increases would be a significant burden on their businesses at a time they can least afford it. We would ask that the city think through all the ramifications of such a decision, and we look forward to working with the city council as you move forward with this issue. Thank you. Thank you. Lucy? Yeah, I'm a property owner and a member of AGLA, and I, I need for this city, pardon me, bring it down to me. 
Yes, um, and I need for the city of Los Angeles to stay out of our business. Uh, them coming into a situation like this is bringing in uh, government jobs versus the businesses that are out there doing these jobs who would then be without a business, without a job. Why does the city need to interfere in our business? What is the problem? We can do our businesses better than the city can. We have much better, we, we pay a lot less money when we don't deal with the city. With as many buildings as I have and as much as we've gone through, I want the city and so do the landlords and tenants that I associate with. They w we would just love to see the city out of our business. I don't have any notes. I don't have notes from what people were saying, but you know, the city just simply, they can't and shouldn't tell us what to do, who to hire, who we can't use. This is not the purpose of the city or of government for that matter. We d I don't want to be told to give up the people who are doing my trash collection so that city people can do it or people who can charge me a lot more money can do it. Why is this happening? Why are we subjected to this? This is the form of depotism. It's telling us what to do, what not to do. I'm not happy about it and I would like it to stop. I would like them to stay out of all of our business and not to make plans for us and not to, what did she say, we decide. Uh, government's not there to, uh, yeah, government are not there to do any of this. We're the governed and we're, they shouldn't be doing anything without our consent. Please speak to us before you do any of these things. Ma'am, can I ask Thank you, you a question, ma'am? Yes. What, what should government do? Pardon me? What should we, it what should, should government do? It should stay out of our way. <laughs> That's period. all it needs, and period. Every, in every industry, no matter what it is, stay government out of our way. should yes, not have should. any regulations. No, no, actually no. It should do roads, it should do the basic things that government is there to do, but it should not interfere in any way, shape, or form with private business. Not in any way, shape, or form. But yes, the, it does have a lot of functions, good functions. Thank you. Ron Saldana? Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the Ad Hoc Committee. My name is Ron Saldana. I'm here today representing the Los Angeles County Disposal Association. We represent mostly medium and small size haulers throughout the Los Angeles area. I'd like to do two things. First of all, I'd like to tell you that from our position, from our association, and the members that we represent, the many, many companies and the many, many employees that we represent, we are totally against an exclusive type of a franchise system. We are supportive of a non-exclusive system. With an exclusive system, basically, you're talking about two things. Under an exclusive system, you're talking about no competition, and you're talking about set rates. So you've got to think about that. We submitted a letter to you uh, a little bit earlier. I'd just like to read very, very quickly a couple paragraphs, if I may, into the record, and then a concluding remark. First, the language of the proposed five-year notice with regard to an exclusive solid waste franchise is grossly inaccurate. City of Los Angeles never decided that exclusive solid waste handling for commercial premises are to be provided, and the city never determined that the public interest would be better served by an exclusive franchise. The purpose of a five-year notice requirement is to allow medium to small haulers to capitalize sufficiently. As a result, this proposed five-year notice is particularly arbitrary because it will affect those haulers' ability to capitalize before the city of Los Angeles has, in fact, made any decision on to whether a future franchise would be exclusive or non-exclusive. And I'd just like to say that under AB 32, which you heard staff refer to a little bit earlier, um, every municipality in the state of California must enact some sort of a mandatory commercial program. And in, in our working with staff and in our looking at your city, we've noticed a couple of things. Number one, you've made great, great progress on multifamily recycling. There's still some folks out there that even though it's free, don't want it. There's a lot of businesses that our customer, that our uh, members go to, to their customers, and offer recycling services. But you know what? Not all of them take those recycling services. So under AB 32, it would be mandatory that everybody conduct and take a recycling service. So Thank you, Ron. And uh, we have your letter on file. Beverly Kenworthy, Bob Amano, and Jaime Garcia. Uh, 
Uh, Beverly Kenworthy with the Los Angeles Area Chamber of Commerce. Um, the Chamber of Commerce is concerned about an exclusive franchise, and we believe exclusive means exclusive, um, where it would just really limit the number of haulers that could qualify to serve the city of Los Angeles. Um, we believe that the environmental standards set by the city and by the state are we're fine with those. We think the city should be able to implement a franchise system that requires um, haulers of all different sizes to meet those standards. Um, so we think that those two things are not incompatible, that you can have medium, small, medium, large haulers, you can have environmental standards, and we can have other standards that the city requires without creating this exclusivity that could cost people their business that could cost people their jobs. Um, we um, have been looking at some of the um, other cities that have done this, and there's a um, recent LAFCO study um, that is suggesting to San Francisco that they repeal some of their 1932 laws that allows for exclusive hauling in their city because it doesn't generate enough competition, and it actually is not generating enough money for the city of San Francisco. Um, so I think we need to look at you know, other cities that are doing this and what the problems they have with that um, as we move forward. We also believe um, that this would be a very good candidate for the Office of Economic Analysis. Um, how is this going to impact the city and what is the best way to roll this out? Um, we certainly don't think people losing their jobs or their companies would, um, would be very good. So thank you. Okay, I agree. Uh, Bob? Yes, good afternoon, council members. Uh, I, we mirror the Hotel Association, uh, its members, hotels, our ownership groups, mirror the uh, sentiments that all our previous uh, speakers has had. Uh, the one scenario that I do want to make is in, in, in relative to a hotel owner, per se, uh, who might have multiple properties, one may be in downtown, one might be uh, in Gardena, the other one might be in the valley, uh, currently uh, they have the choice of who, who their hauler is going to be. Uh, in one big hotel, uh, out of the three hotels might have four different haulers because one particular hauler can't handle the individual types of waste that come out from the uh, from the hotel. So in essence what's going to happen here is that exclusivity uh, remark uh, is is going to uh, really pin down as to who this owner might be able to uh, do you know make a good business out of out of a transaction through negotiations and, and what those haulers can do. Uh, so it doesn't make any business sense for their owner to have to be tied down to say, well, you know, why can't I use that particular hauler I've had good relationships with? They, they've been fair to us. They've treated our, our, our waste properly. And, and, and you know, um, so, you know, that's our concern. Um, of, of course, there's uh, other sidelines that, uh, again, uh, that will come up. But our concern is that we still want, as a business, to have the choice and the selections of who we particularly use. Thank you. Jaime. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Jaime Garcia. I'm with the Hospital Association of Southern Cal California. We're a trade organization representing 170 hospitals in the six county area. Of that 170, about 45 are located within the city of Los Angeles. So I'm here uh, this afternoon to uh, express our concern around the discussion that's been taking place uh, regarding uh, waste sheds. And I appreciate council member Coretz's questions earlier the fact that you know hospitals are very unique service providers in terms of the needs that they have and of the requirements that they operate under state and federal uh, regulations that regulate the manner in which medical waste pharmaceutical waste is is uh, transported and how it's disposed of and so what we're concerned about and why i think the er, kind of question may have come up or comment about exemption is that if the city decides to pursue creating these exclusive waste sheds that hospitals then be exempted because if not, the ordinance, the state law would actually trump a local ordinance in terms of how we handle certain uh, waste streams. Uh, right now, there, you know, in speaking with a the hospital, there is not one hauler that can handle all waste streams. So th and as a result, many of them have multiple contracts for handling recyclables, ph pharmaceutical, medical waste, bi uh, biohazardous waste, you name it, and they have these contracts. So what we're asking is for the hospitals to continue to have that flexibility to negotiate their contracts with the vendors who are certified to provide that service and who can provide and who can meet that need and demand for the hospital. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next three are Philip Katanjian, uh, Wade Hunter, 
And Richard L Lut Lute. Okay. okay. <laughs> Philip. Philip. Oh yes. Yes. Hi. My name is Philip Kotanjan. I'm a resident in the city of Los Angeles. And I am deeply concerned about the city implementing a non-exclusive uh, uh, franchise with the waste services. Uh, my deepest concern as a resident, and I'm newly married, my wife is four months pregnant, I'm concerned about one company being in charge of taking all the trash and recyclables, and then this single company uh, having any kind of labor disputes. They happen all the time. We heard recently up in Seattle there was a bunch of uh, union guys took a bunch of uh, shoremen hostage. Um, I, I can't imagine the thought about walking around the city of Los Angeles, downtown in particular where I live, and uh, have this single company getting into dispute. And there could be good points on both sides. Management might have points. Labor, manage, uh, labor might have points. But in the meantime, my city streets that I love to death, that I love walking in with my, my wife, uh, my city streets are potentially going to be a battle zone where trash is going to be overflowing. We're going to have rodent infestation. And I think the only way to keep this in check is by keeping um, multiple haulers with competition who, if one company decides to go on strike and trash is overflowing, then sorry, um, that business whose trash is overflowing and causing rodent infestation and trash pileup, that business could turn around and say, okay, you guys are on strike. Sorry, you're lost. I'm going to go to another company because I have the freedom to choose, and that company is going to pick up my trash. And my city streets are going to be clean, and um, that's the life I want to live. Like I said, I live in downtown Los Angeles. We all know about the reurbanization. It's a beautiful city. People are coming in, and unfortunately, we don't want people to. People might be leaving, and we don't want that. And I don't think the city of Los Angeles wants that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Wow. Perfect. Wade Hunter. Hi, my name's Wade Hunter. I'm the president of North Valley Coalition of Concerned Citizens, Inc. Um, I guess I was kind of confused because uh, Karen uh, has a definition of exclusive, a state definition. Why wasn't that included? So, Because this has caused a lot of confusion for everybody. We're talking about a report that has a definition that even attorneys can't figure out what it means. And so for us, uh, we had the same problem. Uh, I participated at one of the stakeholders' meeting. Again, we're confused because we're talking about exclusive franchise and non-exclusive franchise. Again, the same word, except we're talking about how it was going to be handled. So I'm very confused about what is going on here. And if I'm confused, the public is, we haven't brought this forward. Uh, I think this needs to, they need to define it properly. Uh, we were opposed to a exclusive franchise because we think it's a big mistake because you're basically limiting to the big companies like Waste Management, uh, like uh, BFI slash Republic, uh, Athens and Crown Disposal. I, I think you're going to eliminate the competition. I think this is a bad thing. The uh, County of Los Angeles has a program that works well and I think that you ought to look to them for guidance uh, as to what they've been able to do with their program. Um, Again, I have a, a very narrow interest. It comes down to Sunshine Canyon landfill. Uh, th this is, a, you know, the second largest disposer of waste. They have a very bad record. They're a public nuisance. But these people are going to be allowed to participate. And these are generally the only people that can even get these kind of waste sheds that we're talking about being able to bid on. So for me, it's a concern that everything is set up properly so that these guys are penalized for the fact that they aren't complying and not allowed to bid. And the city of Los Angeles, was, by the way, was supposed to be down to 500 tons a day into Sunshine Canyon based on the Renew LA plan, and today they haven't accomplished that. Thank you. Thank you, Wade. Uh, Richard? Council members, my name is Richard Lute. I'm with Interior Removal Specialist. Uh, we are a demolition contractor and also a C&D processor in the city of Los Angeles. Last year, we demolished just over 11 million square feet of office space producing nearly 38,000 tons of debris, of which we recycled 76.1%. Uh, I am heartened. I'd like to congratulate the Bureau of Sanitation. They've done a great job with the top subject. 
Uh, I'm heartened to hear that, that they're talking about possibly excluded construction, demolition debris, and medical waste and some other waste sheds from the ordinance. That makes sense. Um, uh, our facility is, is multi-international award winning. Nobody can do what we do. It's nice to know that they're looking at that. But that, that doesn't solve all of the problems. Um, one of the issues that I have with the five-year notification is that's going to put a stranglehold on a lot of small haulers. Uh, Council Member Alderkin, what you said earlier about buying trucks and not being able to use them, it's the inverse. Waste trucks are exceedingly expensive to buy. Uh, due to AQMD Rule 1193, any new trucks that are tasked with strictly handling solid waste must be alternative fuel vehicles, which adds, I don't know, sixty, seventy thousand dollars to the price of the vehicle. The fear now is when we put out this five-year notice, small haulers who want to buy a new truck are going to think twice about buying that efficient vehicle because they're not sure that they're going to be in business in Los Angeles long enough to get a payback for that vehicle they just purchased. I think that's a big issue that we need to look at. If we issue this five-year letter, are we in fact dis, uh, disincentivizing these haulers to buy these fuel-efficient vehicles that the city needs to get our CO2 emissions down? That's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, next three speakers are Doug Arsenault. Adriano Martinez, and Greg Good. Thank you for this opportunity, council members. I'm Doug Arsenault of the Valley Industry and Commerce Association. FICA represents more than 360 businesses that have created over 100,000 jobs in our city and its surrounding communities. Uh, like our fellow Angelinos for a Clean Economy Coalition members, we support a system that accomplishes the city's environmental goals without hindering businesses through rate hikes and a monopolistic system. Just to give one example, Vaughn's grocery stores have a mutually beneficial agreement with one hauler that services their stores throughout the city. Vaughn benefits from discounted rates. The hauler maintains a consistent client. Under an exclusive system, Vaughn's would be forced into six separate agreements with waste shed monopolies or one completely slated contract with a single entity. Rates will undoubtedly rise, doubling or even tripling, leading to higher prices for Angelino families. And this will be the case for all businesses, impacting small businesses, loyal Angelino businesses that our city is trying to keep most of all. Companies that are already facing water, sewer, and energy rate increases in the next few months. We strongly urge this committee to recommend a non-exclusive franchise system that will allow small haulers to modernize and go green, rather than the city immediately eliminating their market share by issuing this five-year notice as it is drafted. We can clean up LA without wasting LA businesses. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Adrian Martinez, and I'm here on behalf Adrian. of the Natural Resources Defense Council and our tens of thousands of members in Los Angeles. Um, I'm going to testify in the next agenda item, but I think there are some issues with this agenda item that merit some discussion. Specifically, I want to discuss some of the legal issues that were raised today. The first thing is many of the same people who testified here today testified previously in support of moving forward solely with the multifamily uh, notice and franchise system. If you notice in transmittal one of this agenda item, the language is very similar. It uses the term exclusive in that language, in that, in that letter. That was issued back in 2006. We didn't see, I, I'm not aware of any objection, legal letters, any objections to that. Um, yet today, with the same language that uh, the Bureau of Staff has addressed why they use that language, you're seeing objection. The second issue I want to address is the notice. The notice is there precisely to give notice. There's nothing in the law that says you need the notice for the notice. And where does that end? Do we need a notice for the notice for the notice? I mean, I think the five years is supposed to give the, the requisite notice. And then the other thing to look, you know, there were claims that people aren't going to buy clean, up, clean trucks and do equipment. In 2006, you issued a... Um, a notice of moving to a franchise system for the multifamily. The question is, did people not buy trucks? We've heard claims from several haulers that they were cleaning up their fleet. And while these voluntary efforts are good, as um, 
an environmental group, we think we need to make sure that we get strong standards. And we think an exclusive franchise system is the way to go. And then the final thing I want to know, note is this is a system of inconsistencies. On the one hand, you hear a lot of people saying these companies are doing a great job, and there probably are some companies that are doing a great job. But in the same agenda item, you heard of people, not of the Bureau of Staff, not being able to get um, consistent records and information. And that's just an inconsistency that needs to end. An exclusive franchise will help that. Thank you. Greg Good? Hi, thank you. So my name is Greg Good. I'm the. Good afternoon. Wait, I'm on? I'm on? Uh, my name is Greg Good. I'm the director of the Don't Waste LA campaign and coalition. We're a group of over 30 organizations committed to higher standards in the waste and recycling industry across the region. We think that there's a system that's better for the environment, that's better for workers, that's better for communities and neighborhoods, and better for the city. Um, before I get to why we think that change should happen now, um, I want to hit a couple of points that, that, that have been brought up, and specifically about rates. And, you know, I, I got to say, I mean, all we hear is rates are going to go up. We hear no data. We hear no real you know, information. We hear a lot of hyperbole, and we hear a lot of sort of Tea Party reactionary. Everything, the sky is falling, rates are going to go up. What's ironic about that is this. First of all, the facts don't bear out. There's 50, 55 exclusive franchises in, in L.A. County's 88 cities. We did a survey of 70 waste bills within three miles of downtown city, Los, downtown uh, uh, Los Angeles. Um, we found rates ranging from $70 a month to $400 a month. Um, and some of those were literally within a mile of each other. Some of those were for the exact same service. Some of those for the exact same hauler. Of the 55 exclusive franchises in LA County, there's not a single resident, there's not a single commercial client, there's not a single landlord that pays anywhere near what the highest rate payer in the city of Los Angeles is paying. Now, we've heard from VICA, we've heard from CCA, we've heard from the Chamber, and I understand their case. Ultimately, um, they represent big businesses. They represent Vons. They represent the hotels. They represent um, uh, these folks who, and they represent big, giant development um, organizations or corporations that do have a ton of properties. And you know what? They do have leverage. They do have leverage. Problem is, is somebody is paying for that leverage. And in a non-exclusive system, it is reasonable to assume that the small businesses and small landlords are actually subsidizing that leverage that they rightfully want to protect. We think that's a problem. On the five-year notice, this is not complicated. It's done. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Um, I want to thank everybody for testifying. You gave some very excellent points. I sound like uh, Bill Rosendahl more than Richard Alacon here, but uh, <laughs> great, 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 great. Um, the... Um, uh, I, I don't. I, I think I can speak for all the committee members that uh, uh, we want to address each and every one of your concerns uh, as we look to this uh, potential transition. Um, I, I, we we want to uh, do it in a way that actually reduce reduces costs uh, to the full extent possible, uh, improves the quality of the service eliminates other environmental uh, degradation that occurs by, uh, for example, uh, multiple service providers going into the same neighborhood, uh, just reducing that uh, emission, those emissions on the community and, and that traffic uh, congestion. Um, and, and all the other concerns you raised, the exemptions are critical. We recognize the special needs of hospitals. We want to see if we can come up with a, a way to do it. We have no predetermination in terms of the number of districts that might be proposed, uh, and I believe that the only way to get uh, to get moving toward an understanding as to and addressing each and every one of your concerns is to move forward with the notice and then hone in on how we would do it if we uh, and how it would be proposed. So uh, I, I don't want anybody to uh, get the impression that if this committee supports uh, the uh, Board of Public Works report that we are in any way diminishing uh, any of your testimony. In fact, uh, I would say the reverse is true. We, we want to hear your specific concerns so that uh, if we go through this transition that we, we do it in a way that, um, that uh, makes it uh, as soft an adjustment on the community as possible. Uh, s secondly, and, and most importantly, uh, 
Uh, we've got to be driven by the mandates that the state has provided. And the, the, uh, uh, the um, uh, diversion rates are critical. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and we've got to get a handle on how to accomplish that. It can't be catch as catch can. As, as much as we've done a great job, catch as catch can in, in some ways, Imagine what we might do if we get control of this and have a better understanding of, and, and can predict where we need to improve and, and, and rein in uh, everybody to meet the same standards across the board, uh, then I think that, uh, uh, that we can do far better and, and ultimately reach our zero uh, waste goal. So, so I want to thank everybody for participating. Uh, and with that, it would be my recommendation that we move forward with uh, the Public Works report, which would then be referred to the Energy Committee uh, for further consideration. And uh, um, is there any objection to that? Uh, hearing no objection, I take those as uh, approvals. Uh, that matter is uh, approved. We move on to item number three, which uh, actually uh, I was thinking of. Uh, San Jose has a... a uh, an experience that I think is is very noteworthy, and and I know that uh, staff will um, look at uh, not just the San Jose model, but a bunch of others. But I think uh, uh, the San Jose experience is is noteworthy, um, and uh, so I want to commend uh, Councilmember Weizar um, for spearheading this, and and Mr. Caretz as well. I guess I put my name on this too, so. <laughs> um, the uh, so this is simply to prepare a report uh, to uh, look at the uh, am I am I correct here? Hold on a second. Yeah, to to look at the San Jose experience and and tell us what's going on up there. Is that correct? Yes, uh, Karen Coca with Bureau of Sanitation again. Um, Yes, this item was uh, is a response to a motion uh, in 2010 directing us to uh, report with a, an assessment of the commercial solid waste system redesign in the city of San Jose and exploring whether um, including the commercial sector with the proposed multifamily franchise that had already been directed would help the city reach its zero waste environmental and financial goals more expediently and efficiently. Um, so we knew that in this case that we would need um, some professional assistance. Uh, since HF&H was the company that uh, has been assisting uh, the city of San Jose, but also assists most of the municipalities in Los Angeles County with their efforts uh, when they do solid waste uh, franchise systems. We contracted with them and um, they have been with us. Th they have done a, a lot of research on these items. Obviously, if they, they have a, a lot of insights since they've been assisting the city of San Jose. Uh, with them, we've conducted eight stakeholder meetings over a two month period and had a lot of comments uh, so their research and the comments from the stakeholder meetings will be incorporated in their final report, um, which we expect to get in, in draft in a, a couple weeks. Um, so we expect that also we are preparing a staff report um, to which the HF and H report will be attached. And that staff report will be uh, reaching our Board of Public Works, we expect, in November. Okay, great. Um, I would be in support of the motion to uh, get the report back. Um, I have to leave, however, and I would ask uh, the uh, chair of public works, uh, uh, since we have no vice chair of this committee, ad hoc committee, uh, to take over and hear the public comment. We have 10 public comment cards. Uh, so with that, uh, is, there, is there a way I can vote to do this? As long as you go on record, yes. Okay. Then I would be on record as uh, supporting the motion. Okay. And to clarify, the motion is to ask for a report back that will come back to this committee for further discussion? Or are we 
directing that to full council. Uh, the motion uh, just request for a report, but I believe that any report would be referred to this committee in as much as this motion is already referred to this committee. Okay, and secondly, um, it will first go to Board of Public Works before it comes back to this committee, correct? Uh, the, the full report that's been examined right now by the Bureau of Sanitation. Uh, it's not required, although if the Bureau of Sanitation would like to run it through the Board of Public Works, they certainly can. Okay. And will you uh, move that in November, irrespective of whether the Energy Committee has heard this item, correct? Well, the, this motion has been referred to this committee. Therefore, the report it's comes back this to this committee. Oh, five I don't know. I'm All items from this committee today have also been referred to the Energy Environment Committee. Okay, but what if energy has not acted upon this motion? You would still move forward with hearing your report in the Board of Public Works and then coming back to this committee. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Mr. Koretz, any questions or comments? Yeah, just uh, one, one last question. Um, I know this is mostly focused on San Jose, but will we be looking at other cities, similar experiences as well, or just Absolutely. purely well, San Absolutely. We're looking region-wide um, at different examples of different types of systems, and that's included in the report. It's, it's not necessarily just San Jose. So you'll look at other L.A. County experiences and other yeah. places in the other state. Other large cities um, around the country as well. Great. Thank you. So I'll begin with public comment now. Uh, I'll call up the three speakers and then I'll follow up with the following three after that. Ryan Minier, Minier, how do you pronounce that? Minier. Minier. Martin Slater and Adrian Martinez. Good afternoon, uh, Ryan Manier with the California Apartment Association. Just wanted to uh, second uh, Councilmember Coretz's question. We would urge the staff to also look at the city of Pasadena and the city of Long Beach. Uh, they both have franchises, but they have multiple haulers in their cities. Um, we also have been following the San Jose issue and believe it's not fully implemented or fully cooked right now. Uh, they haven't set their rates yet in San Jose, and San Jose only covers commercial properties right now and does not cover multifamily properties. Um, so we would urge uh, the staff to look at um, other cities outside of San Jose for the report. Thank you. Hi. Uh, Martin Schlageter with the Coalition for Clean Air and uh, proud CD14 resident. Uh, thanks for the time here and appreciate your leadership on issues of uh, waste reduction and, and the action uh, uh, just taken. I think today's action sets us on course uh, toward cleaner air. And what I wanted to encourage here as you look at other systems and, and to clarify a, a, a mistaken comment of the previous panel, the, when you look regionally, you will find the Air Quality Management District does have a rule for public trash fleets and uh, certain contracts with public tr trash fleets that requires the cleanest technology available. And uh, I want to encourage that the system that you set up here uh, is compliant with that rule, such that you don't have to rewrite your own rules, but that you can fit into the, uh, into the regional system here, which is tested, vetted, updated, uh, you know, and collaboratively created. Uh, and that'll provide some synergies, I think, for your uh, uh, hauler companies as well. But the reality is not just any system requires AQMD uh, or, or requires AQMD standards that you would set up. You really have to move toward a more exclusive system where you're limiting the number of franchisees, where you're setting standards, where you're providing some city market participation, really crafting the marketplace in which they're uh, participating in. And as you move toward a system that is uh, as uh, an exclusive system, that certainly would apply. 
and I believe you'll be able to get some extra efficiencies out of your system in that way as well. So I encourage your regional view on matters. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Martinez, and I'm here on behalf of the Natural Resources Defense Council and our tens of thousands of members in the region. Um, NRDC calls for change in the commercial and multifamily uh, waste system because uh, the one we have now undermines the city's diversion goals and its ability to meet zero waste. And it also unnecessarily feeds regional landfills. The current system also harms communities like those in South LA and the Northeast Valley, which have been disproportionately impacted with more than their share of polluting waste facilities in their backyard. These facilities and the truck traffic uh, that accompany them severely impact the health of the rev residents who live around them. One of the major issues is the current system, which we think doesn't allow for standards. There are very limited standards in that. And what we found is that facilities can be dirty and dangerous, and accountability is hindered under the current system. Uh, despite the best efforts of the city to gain that accountability, um, under the current system, it remains out of reach. An exclusive franchise system will allow for more great, for greater accountability and make sure that higher standards are met and that companies are a true partner with the city. The other issue, I think, that has been discussed today is enforcement. There are a lot of laws in the books. There are laws from the Air Quality Management District. There are laws from the California Air Resources Board. But as NRDC found in a recent report called Uneven Shield, despite California's landmark environmental laws, there's a severe lack of enforcement. So the city cannot rely on agencies like AQMD, California Air Resources Board, and other law enforcement agencies to truly make sure that the waste industry is living up to these environmental laws. And then despite that, the city also, in its attempt to be the greenest big city in the nation, needs to go above and beyond what these laws require. By meeting zero waste, we can uh, clean the environment and create good jobs. Accordingly, uh, NRDC supports a strong, exclusive franchise system for multifamily commercial. Thank you very much. The next three speakers are Alex Salgado, Terry Jackson, and Hillary Gordon. Welcome. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Alex Salgado. I've been a solid waste hauler for 21 years. I've been here before today to speak on this issue. And I'm here again because it is important for me and for my coworkers. We spend the majority of our days working in trucks to provide a service that this city can't go without. But in the current system for commercial and multifamily collection, a lot of trucks we have to work in are dirty and they're dangerous. They're dangerous for us because many of us experience regular trouble breathing as a result of inhaling diesel fume from the job. Some of us even suffer long-term health problems. They're dangerous to the public we share the roads with, too. I've been in trucks and seen the thick smoke blowing from pipes right into windows of cars driven by families alongside us. I've also seen trucks in need of repair that were sent out on the road because companies like to cut corners. We drivers resent this because it puts our lives in danger. But I often wonder what the public would say if they knew trucks were sharing the roads with were unsafe. I've seen trucks with ball, ball tires and broken loose, or loose machinery sent out over and over again until fully, finally there's an accident or someone gets hurt. That, that isn't right, and it shouldn't be that way. Fortunately, I work for a better company now, but there, there are still companies that just don't care. They don't care whether or not they hurt the people who work with, for them, or they don't care about the public either. They don't have to care because there aren't any rules to uh, they have to answer to. They make their drivers drive dirty, polluting trucks. They don't give them proper job training or equipment, and they and they put people's lives in danger. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good evening, Terry Jackson. I um, live in Los Angeles for the last 40 years, I'm a, and I'm a property owner. I had the opportunity to buy a four unit and a seven unit. The four unit right now is being uh, serviced by the city of Los Angeles, which is great. Um, it has recycling bins and so forth. But the seven unit doesn't. 
interesting, I, I sat here and listened to the first group of people that came up. Very strong, very impressive, but not a selling point for me. They're representing big people, big tycoons. Me, I'm just a small guy. When I try to negotiate my rates, the company tells me, oh, well, we'll get back with you, Mr. Jackson. Okay, we'll get back with you. And they got back with me, all right. The rates went up a little bit more. One of my other owners in my area, who's about 50 yards away, same pickup, same company, I'm paying 70, he's paying $72 a month, I'm paying $102 a month. I thought that was kind of absurd. And once again, I went back to the drawing board with these individuals. So more or less, they gave me an op uh, option, well, take and leave a type mentality. I feel that that's uh, very unfair for a small guy like me. Uh, the recycle, there's no recycling there. When I did ask about recycle, oh, well, we can get an extra bin here, but it's going to cost you. It's always about cost, cost, cost. I understand about cost, but a little guy like me, I ain't got a chance here. I have no negotiating power. That's why I support that when you, this, 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 this program that's going to be implemented, I support it because something's got to be regulated here. And as Alex said, the trucks are dirty, they're loud, the, the, the air pollution that goes on, and even safety. I have to regulate sometime when they come through my yard. I walk my, uh, around my whole neighborhood today. I counted 14 bins, five companies pick up out of 14 bins, not one recycling bin available. So I support this movement. Thank you. Next speaker. Good afternoon. My name is Hillary Gordon, and I'm the chair of the Zero Waste Committee of the Angeles Chapter of the Sierra Club. The Angeles Chapter is the largest chapter of the Sierra Club. Uh, we represent about 40,000 members uh, in Los Angeles and Orange Counties who care very deeply about the environment and who work tirelessly to protect it. As a lifelong environmentalist, I see working on creating a zero waste future as part of a larger effort to create a broader system of sustainability that will protect our cities, our planet, and all of its denizens forever. I have been very active for nearly 30 years working to protect and preserve our amazingly beautiful and extremely fragile desert lands. In fighting proposals to build remote landfills in the desert for the trash that we create here in our cities, I realized that the ultimate solution would entail reducing the amount of trash we all create here in the city. And as a lifelong city resident, I've been fortunate to witness the impressive growth of recycling opportunities in Los Angeles, but I'm also aware of how far we still have to go. The opportunity to recycle must be guaranteed to all Angelinos. We cannot expect to achieve our zero waste goals solely by relying on voluntary efforts, especially if those efforts are stymied by lack of opportunity to recycle in the places where many of us live and work. The city must ensure recycling in all multifamily and commercial properties, and we need to do it strategically and comprehensively. Therefore, the question before us becomes, what is the best system to divert the most trash from our waste stream into recycling, reuse, and manufacturing? <coughs> the system we need would do the following. It would foster a partnership between haulers in the city rather than individual arrangements with thousands of customers. Because of the potential for those partnerships, companies will strengthen their bids by providing innovative ideas for meeting diversion goals. It will create a uniform recycling system that is easy to communicate. It will create a market for recyclables and organic waste by being able to predict and guarantee the supply of useful, divertible waste materials. It will help our, our city's economy grow as subsidiary businesses arise to take advantage of new opportunities in reuse and organic processing and it allows us to monitor that what haulers claim is being diverted is actually being diverted. Thank Zero waste is too valuable, indeed too necessary a goal to leave in the hands of a system that does not provide all of those access points and opportunities, and therefore I definitely support an exclusive franchise covering both commercial and multifamily. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Leslie Campbell, Joshua Stelic, and Ron Herrera. Uh, last speaker, we could know who are Leslie? Yes. Uh, Joshua, not here? Okay. And uh, Greg Good, not here? Oh, yeah, either. 
Oh, okay. So just, you're the last speaker. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Leslie Van Kieran Campbell. I'm a sustainability and zero waste consultant. I work with local businesses in Los Angeles to reduce their waste and become more efficient by going green. The first step to greening a small business is to make sure it can recycle. Recycling is the foundation to a green platform, the bare minimum, the no-brainer. Yet so many green organizations and businesses don't and can't recycle. This is a direct result of the system we have currently in Los Angeles for businesses. I say this from experience. I spent three years as the general manager of one of Los Angeles' most popular green restaurants, Gingergrass Restaurant in Silver Lake. There the pursuit of recycling drove me to break the law. We couldn't recycle in the early days at Gingergrass. Recycling service didn't come with our lease, and to add an outside service would have meant significant extra cost to the owner. In the beginning, I took the recyclables home with me to my own blue bin. But before long, we separated too much. The quantity was too great, and I couldn't continue to do that. So we resorted to dumping our recyclables in our neighbor's blue bin the night before pickup. Our example is not unique. Small businesses are often at the mercy of their landlord's decisions to hire recycling services. Those who have the ability to choose must navigate a confusing system with multiple haulers conforming to no standards. A survey of 70 commercial customers in our city found rates ranging from $70 to $400 for the same service within a few blocks. And sometimes the illusion of choice doesn't even exist. Businesses are locked into lengthy hauler contracts that automatically automatically renew prior to their termination date. Many businesses wanting to exercise their right to choose a different hauler find themselves stuck in a contract where they were unaware it had renewed itself. This is the opposite of competition. This is tyranny of choice, a system in which customers are forced to pay for services they can't use or exhaust themselves in vain efforts to locate a service that will save them money. A weak franchise system will not make a dent in this problem. A strong franchise system for multifamily and residential commercial property will create real competition by allowing haulers to compete for the prize of serving our city. Thank you very much. Mr. Corrette, any questions or comments? No, I, 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 other than that uh, I had a similar situation when I was in the state legislature and my district office was in a commercial office building where there was no recycling. And it was kind of ridiculous. We all had to take home batches of recycling and put them in our own blue bins at home. Um, we've made some progress. That was five years ago. We've made some progress, but there's still a lot of folks in that situation. And we clearly have to find a way that every single commercial entity, every single multifamily uh, has, has the opportunity for recycling. Um, I'm not sure exactly how this will all play out, but I think, uh, we need to get the information. We need to see what the state of the art is in other cities. And uh, certainly, uh, this motion makes a lot of sense. Uh, likewise, I, I share the same sentiments. I think our diversion rates can increase dramatically uh, should we move in a new direction uh, in terms of what um, particular uh, users will pay for any new system. We have to look at the data and see what that says and look at other cities and, and make our own estimates and evaluate that. So I think we should move in some new direction and what this motion does is allow us to do the analysis and get the information we need to make an ultimate decision. So uh, I'll go ahead and uh, without objection um, move this item for a report back as uh, Ms. Teller Cohn recorded his vote as a yes. So it would be unanimous. And to recap, this is um, a report back to this committee. Uh, there's a study and other reports going to Board of Public Works, and soon thereafter we'll hear this back in this committee. Uh, and uh, on the item number two, uh, the five-year notice, uh, that is going to council? Uh, that was approved in this meeting, and it's now being forwarded to the Energy and to Environment Energy Committee. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, seeing that there are no general public cards, uh, I'll uh, adjourn this meeting with a second from Mr. Koretz. So ordered. Thank you very much.